Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we talk about everything to do with sex and sexuality, all your questions, your concerns, even your worries. And today I am absolutely delighted to have with us a very good friend, Ravina Gupta, who is also a diet and lifestyle Ayurveda consultant. Ravina, welcome. Hi, Seema. Thank you so much for having me on your platform. Tell us a little bit about um, Ayurveda generally for any of our viewers who may not have come across the, right. uh, the practice of Ayurveda. Sure. So Ayurveda literally means knowledge of life, but Ayurveda is actually um, living life mindfully. And uh, it covers vast um, aspects of life, generally from uh, uh, leading your everyday life and routine uh, in tune with nature. And uh, simply uh, living your life um, uh, with the cycle of nature, uh, circadian rhythms, we go into details of circadian rhythms and morning routines, afternoon routines and evening routines. But we also uh, dwell into complicated health issues like thyroid, cardiovascular diseases and so much more. Um, so that's a very simple definition of Ayurveda. That's just fascinating. It is literally just understanding how to live the way that nature had intended, you know, because there are certain things in the morning which are better for us to do and our body reacts better to them. So what you're saying is it's literally about understanding what nature gives you in the way of energy. Absolutely. And to use it. Absolutely. And I remember you telling me that there are eight branches of Ayurveda, because when I asked you about um, what it okay. says about sexual yes. health, I remember so, you said so, that there are different branches. There are eight subjects of Ayurveda, and they range from um, internal medicine to uh, childcare to pregnancy to uh, even surgery. And the subject that I think we want to talk about today is um, Vajikarana, which is the subject of sexual health, progeny, and reproduction. And okay. uh, in this subject of Vajikarana, Vajikarana actually means having the virility of a horse. So, the, so <laughs> Vaji means horse and uh, Karana means uh, to have the reproductive capacity. Um, so uh, in this subject, we talk about aphrodisiacs, sexual health and reproduction. And the subject actually very clearly and uh, very detailed in a very detailed manner tells us about how and when to have sex. Uh, who can have sex and uh, when they are ready for having sex and what time of the day to have sex and so on and so forth. But aphrodisiacs are used as a tool uh, to have good sexual capacity to reproduce healthy offsprings. And that's what the whole point is to produce healthy offsprings for a healthy society, healthy world and healthy uh, families and so on. You're saying basically that it focuses more in Ayurveda when you talk about sexual health, you focus more on the reproductive health. So how to have a healthy child as opposed to um, sex for pleasure. Is that what I, uh, do I get that right? Uh, no, you have got it right. But also we totally don't discount the sexual pleasure aspect as well, because uh, it is human nature. Uh, sex is inbuilt in our lives to have that pleasure. But uh, the, more, the, the focus is more on the progeny and producing it the right way so that uh, they are healthy and can do uh, perform at their optimal uh, healthy levels. So that is the idea. You know, um, that's just fascinating because I get a lot of people asking about what's the best time to have sex if you want a child, um, how do you make sure that the child is going to be healthy, etc. And I mean, I even get people saying that, you know, if you're thinking about certain things during your pregnancy, is that going to impact the child totally? Will that become part of their thinking, etc.? So tell us a little bit more about how this works. OK, so I think it is important to address how the body functions uh, when it comes to uh, reproducing in a very healthy manner. So what we have in uh, Ayurveda is what we call dhatus, which means tissues in English. But dhatus literally means that which holds or that which nourishes. And we have seven dhatus in human body. 
Um, and I can quickly go over them because it is important to talk about dhatus because that ultimately leads to good health and good health ultimately leads to uh, good sexual life. Um, so, so what we have what is rasa, which is the plasma, rakta is the blood, which leads to muscle, which is mamsa, and then we have medhas, which is fat, leading to asti, bone, bone marrow, and then shukra. And shukra is the dhatu of sexual capacity and of your sexual capability. And once all these seven are in good functioning order is what we get ojas, which is vitality and which is our immunity, the immunity of the body. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about these and how they feed into our sexual wellness. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to point out and say that I love this point you just made, Rubina, because we keep saying to people that good sexual health is not just like it doesn't just drop out of the trees. It's not a separate thing. It's part of the overall good health of the body. Absolutely, Seema, uh, because people think of sexual ability as a separate entity, to be honest. But sometimes uh, maybe because we had such hurried paces of life or hectic pace of life, we forget that actually what leads to sexual capacity is your overall health. And we need to focus on every aspect of life. So it's not just the dhatus uh, uh, and, and how the dhatus lead into the, uh, the sexual health of an individual. We also need to address the three pillars of life, Seema. And uh, according to Charaka, who was uh, very uh, respected, who is a respected authority on Ayurveda, talks about three pillars of life. Uh, ahara, which is food, uh, Nidra, which is sleep, and um, uh, Brahmacharya, which literally means celibacy, but it is actually misinterpreted many times uh, as abstinence. So we can talk a little bit about all three of them uh, in detail, just to touch upon how it affects our overall life, overall health, leading to, again, sexual wellness. So nidra literally means sleep, which means uh, not only when we sleep, is the quality of sleep, and it is the energy of our nervous system. If our sleep is good, we are able to function properly in every aspect of life. And then we come to ahara is what we eat, is the diet, is the food. And it's just not uh, the food. It's also what we take in through our sense organs, what we see, what we hear. It's all digested accordingly in our body. And that's how we react as well. So we, it's very important we take in the right. Um, uh, um, that's how our response will be. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, I've never really thought of that. I'm sorry, I know you're going to tell us about Brahmacharya in a minute, but I just want to make a point of saying that this is what you just said here about the fact that ahara is not just food that you take in, the food of the mind, the food of the eyes, the food of all the senses is equally important. And we're constantly trying to say to people that, you know, the overconsumption of porn, what it can do to you, et cetera. So I hope people actually listen to this particular Absolutely, point because very, is, very carefully. It is what we call the energy of metabolism, digestion and uh, body and physical energy. It, it is the energy of pitta, as we call it. So we have to be careful what we consume in every which way. Um, and then we come down to brahmacharya, which is often misinterpreted as being celibate. But um, it is also about, uh, you know, sex has been built into our life. So it is, a, it is a sense of joy and pleasure. And there's nothing wrong in having the joy and pleasure. But it's also about uh, not overusing, misusing, and abusing a certain aspect. So it's about enjoying life in a certain, in a, in a balanced way. So actually, it's interesting that you should mention brahmacharya because it's something that people have learned the word and they bring this back very regularly into a lot of my reels and they keep sort of going on about how the practice of brahmacharya is very important and a lot of people do misinterpret it as abstinence or celibacy. Can you give us a short definition about uh, you know what this actually might mean i think what happens is uh, brahmacharya also in a certain way means leading a life of a monk in a way so uh, so what happens is 
what monks have done is they have figured out an alternate way of uh, uh, getting to a point of total bliss. And how they have done is through meditation and through yoga. And what happens is uh, during meditation and yoga, especially meditation, certain juices of um, pleasure are released. And, uh, and similarly, in uh, having sex, certain uh, juices of pleasure are released. So, it's, uh, so sometimes we confuse it with being celibate, leading a life of a monk. It's ultimately we are trying to get to the point of bliss and total pleasure. So that is how I put brahmacharya together. It's not abstinence. It's not like if you have taken the vow of being a monk, it's a separate thing. But if you are saying brahmacharya means um, being celibate, I think it's a little bit of a misinterpretation there. Thank you for that. I think that that in itself is going to be a really important point for people to take away. I hope they understand this. Um, okay, so yes, please do tell us, um, you said that these are the three pillars of life that lead eventually to good sexual health. So what we are trying to do is eat right, sleep well, and have a good balance of pleasure. Uh, but we are also saying when we have a right balance of all these aspects, which means it leads to a, a good balance of mind as well, which means there is not a lot of stress. Look, stress is, uh, uh, is a reality of life. There will always be stress. But then how we manage it and how we keep it in balance is very important. So we also need to figure out ways how we manage it, uh, uh, indulge in activities that de-stress us. And um, exercise, I think, Seema, is very important. And, um, you know, we need to exercise, have our insulin in control as well, because a lot of people are insulin resistant. And that's when exercise comes in, helps in uh, maintaining a good, healthy vigor. Uh, you know, managing our emotions, I think, is also a very important aspect of it, uh, Seema. Sometimes uh, we walk around with emotions that are not being dealt with. And uh, that's where the problem lies. We have to, sorry, uh, keep our emotions in check. We need to talk to people, resolve our emotions, generally lead a healthy life. Yes, I think it's of utmost important. And all this actually leads to sexual wellness and our capacity to perform. Rabina, you know, with everything that you're saying, I it just reiterates what we have been saying for years, that sex or sexual pleasure or sexual health is not a separate little dirty sinful part it's very much a part of life and one thing feeds into the other and i think that also is something that i remember you telling me about that there is almost like a parent organ and a child organ for each thing so everything is connected there's like a cycle of connectivity yes so yes so ultimately seema it does go down to the concept of our dhatus and how one dhatu leads to the next to the next and ultimately to the dhatu of shukra which is our seat of reproductive capacity and sexual wellness we had mentioned like how our blood feeds our muscle feeds the bones etc so when we talk about let's say erectile dysfunction so what happens in erectile dysfunction sometimes is uh, a thick blood in the human body in the man's body now what happens is when they have thick blood uh, it means it has armor, it has toxins in it. It, it means it has blockages and it is unable to travel to the right part of the body. And hence, we need to take care of that, which means it goes back to eating properly. So if we, so it's actually living your life mindfully, focusing on every aspect, right? From food, sleep, um, pain, pleasure, stress, exercise, uh, and also, also very important aspect, I think, is see my indulging in activities that fulfill us and have hobbies, have friends that fulfill us. I think all of this is ultimately wellness in every which way. Thank you. I think most people don't realize, we keep reiterating this, that um, good erections, good arousal in both men and women depends on really good blood flow to the sexual organs. Absolutely. The blood flow has to be really, really good. And like you said, if the blood is thick, it is not going to get to the sexual organs properly. Like you were saying, there will be blockages. Um, and if there are toxins, it's causing other issues. So the very first thing that you might want to address is something as simple and straightforward as 
your diet so that your blood flow becomes okay absolutely so like i said it's just so many things that are intertwined it's your lifestyle it's your basic daily what we call dinacharya in ayurveda is your daily routine and which tells us what we're supposed to do uh, in the morning what we're supposed to do in the afternoon and what we're supposed to do in the evening and bedtime and that includes food that includes um, uh, taking in certain herbs if you need to and uh, just generally uh, you know small small routines of uh, even uh, tongue cleaning and so on and so forth there is so much we can talk about here Wow. Okay. So uh, tell me something. You talked in the beginning about the fact that Ayurveda basically focuses, when they talk about sexual health, they focus on progeny, on how to have healthy progeny so that, um, you know, the life cycle continues in a healthy way. Rabina, can you give us some advice on this idea of how to have really good sex in order to produce really healthy progeny? Absolutely, Seema. So there is not just one thing that you can do. There are several things you can do. And okay, let me not put pressure on you by saying there are several things you can do. Because let's say if I tell you 10 things, and even if you're not able to do 10 things, you can do maybe three things properly. This can bring about a massive transformation in, in every aspect of your life, including your sexual wellness. So when I say sleep on time, it's just not like just going to bed. It means like what time? And 10, 10, 30 p.m. is the best time to sleep, uh, touch yourself in bed. And uh, how you wake up, when you wake up in the morning, the quality of your sleep, good nutrition, which includes actually no smoking and limited alcohol. I won't say no alcohol. <laughs> um, exercise, avoiding stress, uh, figure out ways of dealing with your stress. Uh, resolve any emotions that bother you, uh, keep them in check, seek advice uh, if you haven't tackled emotions, uh, limit sugar intake, hydrate, do yoga, and lastly, uh, indulge in activities that fulfill you, that make you happy, that give you joy every single day. I think that's the best aphrodisiac if you ask me. So, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think all of those things that you said are the best aphrodisiac because people don't also realize that it's the level of comfort and relaxation that you need to have before you have sex for it to be good sex. It's, it's a state of mind, like they say. So and, and also, uh, realistically, even if you can't do all of these Try to do three uh, a day and see, you know, uh, it, it does make massive, massive, uh, it can bring about massive changes in by doing even the simplest of uh, three of these things that I have mentioned here. Tell me something. I think one of the biggest problems in today's world is unresolved emotions. You know, the uh, we have so much noise around us and I'm not just talking about physical noise, I'm talking about the, the overstimulation, whether it's the television, whether it's social media, whether it's just everything around us is just so loud that it doesn't give the brain enough time to just calm itself down. It doesn't give us, I mean, I find that there are days when I'm, I'm almost frazzled. I'm like, I feel like I'm running ragged because we all do a lot of things and we could easily go from one thing to the next quite calmly, but we don't. Yes, we... Seema, that's that's where where I would suggest, like when you feel that way, it's just that when you have to mindfully tell yourself that you withdraw all your senses, go within, take your time and just let them not play a havoc on you. All these emotions, they, like you said, they overstimulate you. You just need to go within yourself, quieten the senses and do what you do best in your time, maybe even read a book or do some breathing exercises uh, that can help you. And, uh, and you know, also there is something about uh, willpower. I would like to talk about willpower here. It's very easy to go into and get caught into um, uh, the, the frazzling lifestyle that you have or may have. So you just need to have a little bit of willpower, a little bit of discipline. When you have to use your willpower for your discipline, it's a it's a problem. It should just come naturally to you. And that again, it'll come to you with practice. 
willpower is a strong, strong thing. It can do loads for you. Very true. I find that um, to everybody out there, I'm going to admit, I need to use a lot of willpower for my discipline. So I need to change that about myself first, don't I? We all do, Seema. I think we are, at the end of the day, simple, normal human beings. But to try is our duty to ourselves. It is indeed. You know, um, certainly having reached a certain age by, you know, I'm now uh, going to be 61 this year. And I think that um, the best thing that a lot of people will say, or the best thing you can do for yourself is to stay healthy. I think the best gift that we can give our families, our children, is to keep ourselves healthy. I think we all have to learn that we are responsible for our own good health. 100%. It's not somebody else's problem. Uh, there is no debate about this that, yes, uh, we have to 100% look after ourselves. We don't want to be a burden on our children, on our families, on our societies. We need to be functioning at our 100% optimal self. Rabina, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope that uh, everybody listening in has managed to take away a lot of tips, really useful, sustainable, good advice for your life ahead. And I think the most important point that Ravina has made today, and I really hope it comes and finds a space in your mind and in your heart and your body, is that sexual health is part of your overall good health. It isn't a separate thing in your life. Everything in your, in your body, everything in your mind is connected one to the other. So for everybody who's listened in and would like to consult with Ravina on any of these issues that she's talked about or any other kind of lifestyle and diet health to do with Ayurveda, you can get in touch with her either on her Instagram handle, which is five elements Ayurveda, or she also has an email address, which is Rabina's Ayurveda at gmail.com. But don't worry if you didn't catch that because it's all going to be there in the, um, in the captions below. If you found that this was a useful uh, podcast, please do like, comment, subscribe, or you can, of course, write to me with your other questions on info.seema.anand at gmail.com. Our message to you as we finish is stay healthy, stay well. Everything begins from here. It's how you think that will impact the way that you behave, which will impact the way that you treat yourself and your body, because everything is one great big entirety. We are not little fragments. We are a whole. And um, I think, Rabina, I'd like to finish by saying thank you so much. Thank you so for much, Sina, for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. Take care, everyone. And uh, we will see you next time.